I met a traveling man today who spoke of everything and nothing. I asked, how long you here to stay? My whole life if I'm lucky. Lucky? How so? I replied. His response broken only by the lady near his side, whose eyes caught his and paused his speech and mine, almost as if a sign, some invisible confirmation was given between the two that no one else on the entire train knew except them. We all were cold except them. Welcome, everybody, to the inaugural podcast, or my first podcast doing this. I'm Barry Quarter. I'm a reporter with the Chattanooga Times Free Press. I've been doing this for 31 years. I've covered everything from entertainment, music, uh, food, uh, arts, uh, fine arts, uh, just everything. Uh, It's part of what I love about the job is it lets me basically live vicariously through some really, really interesting people for an hour, half a day, a week, or whatever. My first guest, uh, and on purpose my first guest, is Genesis the Gray Kid, uh, somebody that I met probably three, four years ago. Yeah. Uh, we have talked many times since. He is someone that, to me, represents what's great about this city, Chattanooga, that I live in. He's someone that represents uh, a great spirit, a creative spirit, Um, just so many things that I like about Genesis that I want to share with you guys uh, because you need to know him, but also because of what I just said, he represents uh, a lot of what I think is really cool about this city Uh, If you don't know anything about Chattanooga, um, it was an industrial town for many years, uh, suffered like so many did for decades. Everyone left the downtown area, business left and all of that, and it has undergone an unbelievable renaissance, I think in large part because of creative people just like Genesis. Um, You were born here. But didn't yeah. stay here very long. Right? Yeah, yeah. I was born here, um, and we were here for about three days. Yeah. My mom drove up from Georgia. Um, there was this doctor that I believe I don't remember his name, but he delivered my sister, and she really liked the whole process. So she loves this city. She's from here. Okay. So she drove up. I was here for three days, and then after that, we. Uh, Got on the road. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> been traveling since. Traveled everywhere, and then um, how long ago came back? Uh, I came back. So I would we would visit every summer. So for two or three months, we'd hang out in Chattanooga. Right. Um, but I didn't I didn't move here until maybe 2006. Okay. Could live anywhere. You yeah. were living in New York. Yeah. At that time, right? Well, well, yeah, I, uh, I think I was in New York maybe 2011. Okay. So I, I, when I came here, I, I fell in love with the city, and even when I was kind of rooted here, different opportunities would pull me away for a year or six months. So when I was in New York and Lower East Side, that was for five months and then in Brooklyn for like almost a year. Okay. And I'm going to ask you, I, I, I was making a few notes before you got here, uh, how to describe what it is you do. And the, the words I came up with were poet, songwriter, performer, painter, artist. And, and I was going to ask you to rank those in uh, order how you would, how you would describe what you, who you are. Yeah, I would, I would say, uh, Poet, fine artist, and creative. Uh, I still write music. It's just, and I, I love music, but the creative, I think, uh, it, it 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 covers a multitude of different ways I express myself, be it through music or if it's through a book or if it's through, you know, this conversation. Right or a creative project where I'm just the poet in the room. Um, 
but yeah, poetry and fine art, they're almost neck and neck. They're almost neck and neck. That's one of the things, and and I, I hope you and I are going to talk many times for this podcast because you do so much. One of the things that's fascinating to me about you is what we were just talking about. A lot of the guys, people that I've met are just poets, or they're just painters, or they're just songwriters. Maybe they're singers, performers as well. And that's not a knock on them at all. Right. Um, you know, they're good at it, they're focused at it. You integrate so many different things in your work. Your, your words in paintings that uh, are different than anything else that I've seen. Um, and I know you've had some gallery showings New, uh, at L.A. And, and New York, and you got one coming in the Hampton sometime soon, and uh, you always do one here. So we're, I want to get into that a little bit deeper. But that's sort of started my beginning with you anyway. We first met in regard to a book that you were about to put out. Yeah. Words in Gray. Words in Gray. Which is a book of poetry. Yeah, and uh, creative exercises. How did that book come about? I mean, I had a, a, a lot of poems and and, and thoughts and, and things that just kind of lived in my bones that I wanted to put into a book that, that I could share with people because I don't, I performed before early, but I don't, I don't really enjoy performing. I know I have a lot of friends that love it that they they almost get a high from being on stage and, and performing, whether it be a song or a poem or whatever it is. For me, I almost feel, I get that same feeling when I like write it down, maybe on a, a little napkin or something, and I hand it to somebody. And they go off and they read it, and then they hit me up a week later, like, bro, that poem you wrote, like I read it, Oh man, my eyes like watered up. I had to read it like five or six times. Like that, uh, mm. I like for people to kind of carry it off with them. I want them to read it in their own kind of head. I, I like that, you know? Um, and so I always would explore ways to make my work more discoverable without me having to be on a stage. So that was another reason why I wanted to put it into a book. I love people. And so we were already doing the little poetry workshop where I would get people to explore and get creative. But um, I just wanted to find a way to, to bring more people in on that process of tapping into that, that wholeness I believe we all have. So that's kind of how it came about. And I, I finished it on a train coming back from New York with Drew Bells, uh, owner of Fancy Rhino. He, uh, Another local creative doing some really cool oh, stuff. Oh, yeah, super talented guy. And um, we had some drinks in New York, and then I'm like, hey, man, I'm catching a train back. You you ever rode a train? He's like, no, I was flying back. I'm like, nah, man, just get a train ticket. Almost missed the train. He jumped on the train. We had a convo for a couple hours, a 16-hour ride, and the rest of the time I finished the book. I had a lot of it already written up, and a lot of it was already kind of in my heart. Mm -hmm. I just needed to kind of map it out and organize it. Yeah, it was fun. Funny you say that, because that was when I was just thinking, I don't think I've ever asked you before, or, or maybe you said it a couple of years ago, but looking back now at what you've done that I know of, it almost looks like there was a plan. Yeah. Has there been a plan? Was it do the book, do these workshops, do this art. I know at one time you told me, and I don't remember the exact quote, but it, but it was basically that you wanted to be, uh, these are my words, but a poet rock star. <laughs> you know what I mean? You yeah, wanted to, because no, we don't really have, right? I think right. You, you were saying Maya Angelou was gone, and we don't really yeah. have a... She was definitely a rock star. For sure. But this, yeah, this, I feel like there's just kind of a void. Um, I mean, there's some real talented and amazing poets out there. I just feel she kind of, the way she impacted culture, I mean... Yeah, I don't. I didn't get that as being there aren't talented people. Right. It was that the public doesn't see them for the value that they should. Absolutely. That's the way I understood Absolutely. it, to, to what you were saying. If, if we were to take a poll and we ask people 
who's the current poet laureate right now? I'd say probably 90% of the population of America probably doesn't know. And, and that hurt me, you know, because it's for a poet. I mean, that's a great, that's a, that's a great honor, but where it's just the way it's been kind of thrown aside poetry and I, and I see it in everything. Um, the way it's kind of thrown about, I just it just made me feel kind of agitated a little bit. So that that was the push on wanting to um, just make like a, a, a an impact, man, and a and a I don't know, I don't even know how to say it. Just an impact in a yeah. real way. Maya did that for sure, but I think it'd be dope with all this stuff going on right now. I think it'd be dope if they were like, "All right, so we got a poet on the line here." You're just gonna—I mean, just someone that's just really tapped into their own, their own kind of magic and, and humanity, and, and seeing they're acute to empathy and seeing things from different perspectives, and they can just give you a very kind of round, uh, beautiful expression of maybe where the the country is. Mm -hmm. They're not on one side. They're not on another. They're just—it it, can—it can. It can uh, remind us of how human we are they're not they don't got any poets on cnn talking right now no no and um it, it's i think what's so good about it to, or interesting about what you do again is that whole integration thing it it makes what you do accessible mm -hmm. to a lot of different people poetry for whatever reason falls in the similar categories as classical music Oh, fine totally. painting, totally. it intimidates totally. a lot of people. Uh, beyond the roses are red, <laughs> we all know those. But the 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 heavy stuff, the T. S. Eliot, yeah, can intimidate people, but it doesn't have to. I mean, to, it, right. to me, it's it's like a song lyric. Oh, totally. You know, they're they're very similar. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's jump over the rail without looking for water or waste time on the debate, the choice. Let's explore and forget our names and find our voice on the rocks that look like faces through the woods leading to a farm where simple and breathing are the same. I don't know that I let you finish your answer about is there a plan? Is it all? Yeah, no, it, it definitely was a plan. I think for me, it's hard for me to to move without. I mean, I, I'm very agile in the sense of everything isn't mapped out, but it's definitely a lot of intention and thought uh, that went into the book and the workshop. And when the when the idea came into me to to really push on um, merging a visual aspect with the things that I was doing, it kind of already was like showing itself like in the book, there isn't, there's no titles, they're all colors that I felt when I was writing the poem. Mm -hmm. And it's almost just taking that to the next step of, well, let me exp act physically express this in color, you know? With the painting. With the painting. Um, Writing the book, I wasn't thinking about painting it, but I still was expressing colors. Like, it was still there. And it, it, it just kind of came to the surface. It's, I think it's, it's a bewildering thing how that all kind of happens. Part of that, too, again, um, I talk to a lot of artists in a lot of mediums, and the marketing part of it, if that's the right word. A lot of people don't like it. Yeah. They don't like interacting with people. They don't like, I don't know if it's an ego thing or a fear of rejection thing or all of that or, you know, they, they the, the perception or the cliche is the artist holed up in a studio that never wants to get out. And that's not you. No. And I, and I think... You know, every artist is different, but I would love to see more artists kind of interact with people because they can provide such a healing, you know, it's like monks or something. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I don't know if we're if 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 most artists are not good at it or they're just unpracticed at it, which probably in my eyes would make uh would make a greater need for it, you know. But I, I fell in love with the art of moving, making the things that I was creating discoverable. I fell in love with that art. Uh, and that's, I guess, under that creative umbrella. How it's, you know, poet, fine artist, creative. I felt like, as an artist, everything that I'm doing, I need to approach it as if I'm writing a poem or painting, painting a canvas. Like, all right, so I want to have a show. I would think, like, I I wouldn't think of it as like a, as a marketing guy. I just think of it as, all right, I'm an artist. What do I want to see? And if I was an artist walking in, what do I want to feel? All right, what can what can evoke the most? Oh man, what if I make a little booklet and then I put them in balloons and then I release them from a helicopter? You know, like mm -hmm. I don't know if it's gonna work, but it it feels right. It's it's like it's like some people they check the weather radar, you know, on their phone. And but then you got some people that can just put their hand out the window and they're like, yeah, I'm gonna bring a jacket and an umbrella. I think I'm kind of one of those dudes. Like I, I've been, I can, you know, I, I smell the rain, I can feel the breeze a little bit, and and I can, you know, it it just it it, it all feels right. Even when it doesn't work out the way I planned, um, there's this there's this sense of it. It was so genuine the way I did it because that's a place where I'm coming from. Like bringing a jacket and then the sun comes out and it's too hot, I can tie it around my waist. Like it, the, 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 yeah. the groove is still there, it's, you know? You mentioned the train ride. I think, I think it was not long after you released this book, if, I'm, if my memory is correct, you were getting ready to take a cross country drive yeah. to help you get ready to start creating yeah, the paintings I, absolutely. for one of your first showings? Yeah. First guy. Okay. Yeah. So, and you've done that twice now. Oh, like five country. times. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about that process because that's an important part of how you work, isn't it? Oh, totally. People who see you, in fact, in the, the last story that I wrote, I, I think I said you probably people all over town know who Genesis is, whether they know it or not, because... The dreadlocks are very distinctive, obviously, but you're everywhere and you're always walking. So the walking, the driving, you could have taken a plane. Yeah. You could have not taken that train. You could have taken a plane. But it was very intentional to take that slow ride. Yeah. Right? Totally. Why? Well, I just feel like when you walk or in a car or in a train, it takes... To get to LA, you gotta catch a train in Atlanta. Man, on a plane, how long does it take? Five hours? And on a train, it's about 98. Yeah, and on a plane, you see the back of somebody's head. It's five hours. <laughs> yeah, right? same and head. On the train, I mean, there's like 14 people where we were well, different people. I mean, my beard kind of grew out. Like, everybody, you, know, you just become connected in just a deeper way um, but it gives you an opportunity for these little small interactions and through those interactions is where I get a lot of ideas to write I, I met a guy from Louisiana we actually picked him up in Louisiana he was telling me about uh, this little island off the coast of Maine that I'm really really wanting to see I think it's called Mohegan Island or something like that. You heard of that? I have heard of that. He's like, man, it's a place for artists. It's been like last 200 years. It's, it's like 30 miles off the coast. Man, we talked for about four hours. Then I wrote a poem from his perspective about what I think he he went through before he got on the train. Like I, I Like, I guess in my mind, he was like at a cafe. He, you know... His son, he lost his son, and in some way saw that in me, and and it and it's and it's a short poem, but it 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 eliminates me trying to force something. I can kind of just let my hand just move 
on its own. Um, and it's fired by real interaction. I remember the softness in his eyes and how tender his voice was. You think he, you think he, like, just left a funeral or something. I mean, he had a real kind of. He wasn't sad, but he just, he just had this tenderness to mm-hmm. him. It, it just, it. I mean, from that moment, I wrote like five poems, and from those five poems, when you read it. You don't know I'm talking about him. You don't know I'm writing from his perspective. One of the poems was from the perspective of the cup that he had, that he was kept drinking coffee out of, because it wasn't a cup that was on the train. He brought this cup with him. Mm. And so I, then I thought, man, I wonder what kind of life this cup, cup has had. It had a chip, like, I guess he dropped it somewhere. And so not, I, a, not a paper cup. Or no, a it was like a, cup. It was a, like a real... Wow. Yeah, and, and so... Writing from the perspective of the cup, on, on, uh, I mean, the the power of of whatever this cup has, like, I don't know. It, it's just that relationship, and I never mention cup in the poem. And when you read it, you might be, it might remind you of your best friend, or it might remind you of, you know, I don't know, a a, a child or someone you love. You, no one has any idea I'm talking about this cup. And my I life think and from my suitcase, my taking this and my long way cup, to where my I'm heart going, and my palm, I'm, I already got to go. I already need to be in L.A. Right. So and in between I just take my skin, time get in there. Life and by the time I get there, I might have 50 poems of just moments that I, I could not have created in a basement. See, and that's, that's what... Because you took, you didn't drive like the main highways. You took a circuitous route on purpose. Small towns and yeah, there was back roads and there's like two or three different ways I've done it. And one was I take some back roads, and then after a little bit, I'm like, oh man, I, you know, I still got like thirty hours. Like I yeah. gotta then I jump on a highway. I got you. Then I jump back off. You know. What I like is you you left, I mean, you, you left knowing what you were going to see and observe and all that would inform your poetry, but oh, you didn't completely. have an agenda. You didn't no. say, I want to go see poverty or no, no, beauty not at all. or any, you didn't, it was see what you see and then react. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, that's the only way I think you can kind of fall into those utopias of presence is when you kind of because if you if you think too much you'll get in your own way and you'll miss it it'll it'll move past you instead of instead of you just kind of being porous and letting it kind of flow through you um, I try my best to get out of my way you said that to me once before. I think yeah. every time. That's that's a big theme with you, isn't it? Is oh don't man! Don't get in your own way. Yeah, I've talked myself out of stuff a lot, and I regret it. Like I wanted to do something, I was like, oh man, but I don't know. You know, I, I've never done that. Or oh, man, mm, what are people gonna do? I cut that out a while ago. Yeah. Because that 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 that'll keep you from like possibly stumbling upon something you're really yeah. great at. Probably some of the best um, moments, interviews, whatever that I've ever had were either things I didn't want to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, my favorite all-time story interview was with a World War II veteran that had been shot down, and I didn't want to talk to the man at all because I'm thinking he's going to be elderly, yeah. worried about his senility. You know, is it going to be anyway? He. Uh, an incredible story. Tears. I, I cry almost every time I retell the story. Nice. It happens a lot where I don't want to go. Almost man. every time where I don't want to go do it, and it ends up being an amazing uh, thing. So I, I get, I get what you're talking about. I'm really, really glad to hear you bring that up because I think this is, I think this may end up being one of the sort of themes to this whole podcast because. I'll be honest with you, conversations with you have what, are what pushed me to do this. Um, I wanted to do something similar for a long, long time mm-hmm. and just 
I called you last week for that yeah. very reason. I said, why are you, why are you sabotaging yourself? <laughs> Let's call a man and let's do this. Yeah. See where it goes. Um, and I think, for me, it's a lot of what I think has happened in this city is people with that similar attitude. Um, I've, like I said, I've written about it for 30-something years. I think I fell into that sort of comfort zone that the city did, mm -hmm. which is, well, it's just the way things have always been, or things have got to be there. And what changed, in my opinion, is people like you came to town, uh, even though you had a history here, um, it wasn't ingrained, you, right. you weren't. So people like you came and said, why can't we do this? Why can't we have that? Um, I've told a few people, as, as a reporter, I've seen a lot of the growth and changes. And for people who don't know anything about history, I mean, the history of Chattanooga, it really sort of blew up after the Civil War. You did have a lot of carpetbaggers come in and made a lot of money uh, through the railroads, through Coca-Cola, through industry and all of those things. And so there's a lot of that family stuff here. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a lot of the families that, inter that married, and so you've got a lot of connections. And, and basically the joke was there were a few families that lived on Lookout Mountain that ran everything. And it was that way for a long, long time. Yeah. And I, so I knew a lot of that background, and so when, when all this renaissance started happening I sort of felt like my value was the institutional sort of knowledge thing and I, I noticed after a while that I would bring that up in meetings or conversations with people and I could see their eyes roll back in their head and I thought well they're just disrespecting the old guy kind of thing you know and I took offense for a little while and then it dawned on me they don't care yeah I think I told you this they don't care, and then it dawned on me, not in a bad way, that they're not trying to be insulting. They just don't care that whatever uh, venue had been tried before, or restaurant had been tried before, they don't care that it didn't work. They want to do it, and they want to see it, mm -hmm. and they want to try. Mm -hmm. And once I, I made that realization, it was just a beautiful kind of thing, really. I was like, wow, these are the people that I want to hang out with. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it really, I'm very serious. That was an eye-opening revelation for me, not just professionally, but personally, mm -hmm. to see these people. For people who don't know, the city itself got it, created several things. One called Create Here was an organization that um, reached out to artists, creatives. We had a... Um, and a, a, a I think Ellen Hayes was on that. Was Ellen that, Hayes yeah. was part of that. There was a pro. There is a program. There was a program rather where the city provided um, breaks on housing costs. You got mm -hmm. a stipend basically if you moved here to a certain part of town and you were creative and you stayed for a certain time. Many of the people that I know that came have stayed. Um, it worked. That's the whole Main Street change that we've seen which has been incredible right yeah was sort it's of been really fast how that created happened. by that or, or at least primed right. by that so it's a it's a completely different mindset in my opinion and it and it's important this city it makes it it's easy for me to work in this city mm -hmm. i can create very well here um I, I'm just, I'm in my zone here. Um, here is, is way more um, exploring my own interiority. Like it's more internal, like I'm looking more inside. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm going on those walks, I might be looking at the ground. I don't know where I'm looking, but it's like I get to, I just, I get to really feel. And, and through that is where I feel like I create my best work. But with what, with where I am in my career, it, it's the, the show we're having in the Hamptons in November, me and Audrey Shields and um, a couple other friends. Those, those type of shows are important in my career right mm -hmm. now. Yeah. 
Yeah, we, I want to get into that uh, for sure because you're doing some huge stuff. But talking about the city again, and, and I was thinking about this before uh, this morning before you got here. Place can dictate, can inform a lot for an artist. I mean, you can think of. I mean, the obvious to me, Woody Allen, you think of New York. Yeah. You know, there are certain artists that you think of. Uh, beach, trees, woods, the, the Hamptons, the... Um, but the city, you can make art anywhere. Right. You can... Um, you don't have to live in a New York or in LA to be an artist. But one of the knocks that I I know about living here is it's still pretty tough to make a living oh, yeah. as an artist here. It we is. Are, as much as we brag about our city yeah. and we love it, it's not like you're selling a lot of product out of here. Yeah, it, it is tough to make a living in the city as an artist. And I mean, that's that's another reason why I travel so much is because there's a lot of larger cities that are, that really rally around my artwork and my poetry, and and they buy enough of it to where I can make a good living. But if I depended solely on Chattanooga, it'd be extremely difficult. Right. Yeah. That may. I, I think that's another uh, topic. I, I did a big story several years ago about creatives living here. Nearly every artist said the same thing. And we have some. Some you know John Henry the sculptor is yeah. here. We have some, we have some national and internationally oh, yeah. known artists, and they all say, yeah, I, if if I had to survive on what I sold here, I would starve. Oh yeah, I mean, but we, they like it here. Yeah, I mean, this is a gem of a city, but yeah, it's hard to to sustain yourself just selling work here, and and I and and this is just my humble opinion. I I I do love the nonprofits we have here. I almost feel like we do have too many. Mm. It's almost oh, yeah. a thousand or so nonprofits here, and it seems like a lot of them overlap in some of the, the things that they, they wish to accomplish. Um, I, I do I do love the, uh, I think that a lot of the intentions are in the right place. I just feel like it's kind of top heavy a little bit. And there's a lot of artists here that are dependent on the, the nonprofits to to sustain them, that they almost have to, their art almost becomes handcuffed to some other thing. Mm. And that can always affect the quality of your art. It can, it can, it can, it can really hurt the artist. And I think too much of that, it makes, it makes you so dependent that if you were to stop being funded, if the grants did slow up, you haven't you haven't created that appetite to hunt in the wild. I eat what I kill. You know, I'm I'm in the wild. I'm like a yeah. like, and so I think is I think it's good for artists to to struggle, but learning through the struggle, making a plan, building with other artists that are making a living creating. You know, getting grants is awesome. It's it's great, but just not being so dependent and that that's one of the things I see here is some of the, the bigger non profits, I mean, they have so much so their resources are, are huge in, in such a small city that a lot of the artists are like grabbing at the same thing. That's a good point. I haven't thought of that. They, an, another issue along those lines is the idea of donating. Uh that was a topic that came out of that story that I that I did where we have a lot of nonprofits that have a lot of galas, a lot of fundraisers, and, and they ask artists to donate work that can then be sold. And it never, I'll be honest, it didn't occur to me. Uh, that's not a good thing. Yeah, the artist is already struggling. <laughs> the artist is A, already struggling. They yeah. don't get to claim the value of the art piece that yeah. the nonprofit can, from what I understand. On their taxes, they get to claim the cost of the canvas and the paint, <laughs> for example. And yeah. they're always told, you'll get exposure. Yeah, which isn't 
which is necessarily true. You can't eat it. <laughs> yeah, you can't eat it. <laughs> and you know, it's and I, but I do know the intentions. I feel Absolutely. like the intentions are well. So this isn't a, a diss to anyone, but I do no. think it is dangerous. It is to be that dependent on um, nonprofits to sustain yourself. Right. Uh, it is confusing to me how we invest so much in businesses, but that is. I'm I'm blown away that we haven't revisited what they were doing before and investing in individuals. I know they did that with you said um, what was that thing? Start here or make oh here? yeah create here create here. That sounded like something make. that where they invested personally into individuals. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a ton of sense. Absolutely. You and gotta invest in the, yeah. You gotta invest in the people. And, it and worked. I don't I don't have the answers, but. I know what's not working, yeah. you know? Yes. And uh, I think if if we don't at least just start looking at things from a different perspective, there are going to be more and more talented people that move away from Chattanooga sure. because they couldn't sustain themselves. Well, yeah, there's there's a lot of those issues. Um, there's the usual, you know, the, the, the profit in his own town is never, you know, um, for some reason people here and everywhere. And in and, and what we're talking about, I don't think Chattanooga is different than other than, say, no, the big I, right. metropolis areas. Right. Uh, there are artists in, I'm sure, you know, Nashville, Knoxville, Birmingham that are not doing well there either. No, absolutely. Um, so there's that. But the, the idea of uh, buying local, you know, buying a Genesis piece for some reason to some people think, well, it can't be that valuable because he's here and I see him all the time. Yeah. But the guy in L.A. is happy to pay. You know, right. That, and vice versa and all that. That's just nature what, of this sort of thing in some way. The the wild thing is that's very true. And then once they're reminded of whatever, like the article that, that you had wrote up that talked about L.A., I mean, I might have got I might have got 40 calls about artwork some of the same people that already knew I was doing art but now since oh what he was with Spielberg he was with Holly right. Berry da, da, da. now it's almost like well let me take a look at that art let me <laughs> yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's, that's that's you're right that's how it is when in your own city right or you know sadly some terrible accident has to happen and then you're oh well yeah that's, it'd be uh, good for the art <laughs> <laughs> well, one time it'd, it'd be good for the art but no, I don't want to get it like no, that. I don't want to do it that way. <laughs> all right. Well, like I said, we could do this all day long. I, I do want to visit. Uh, I want to end with, uh, I want to get you to tell a story that you told me about your trip to L.A. Because it kind of ties in what you were saying earlier about the whole uh, not getting in your own way. Because I've thought about it a lot. But the, that that night that you went to the big party and had to go through the kitchen. Oh man, that was wild. That was like a movie. What, do, you, do you mind no, telling no, the story? No, no, I don't mind. So uh, I, as soon as I pulled into LA that time, I drove. I rented a SUV, got a, um, a U-Haul kind of hitch, and I brought maybe 30 pieces with me. So this ride, I got a trailer behind me. And there's some parts of this trip that get kind of gnarly a little bit going through the mountains. But we made it. Um, I rode with my homeboy Thurston. He 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 was with me. He was my passenger. And so, uh, where were we? I think we were in West Hollywood. I'm there four hours. into. The, I, I just got here. I just ate. I haven't slept. We didn't sleep. I, I Sometimes I can get so like locked in on something and my mind just keeps going like I didn't I didn't even sleep I just drove 32 hours straight through which I'm I don't suggest anyone do <laughs> um, but I went straight through so I was I was getting tired because I had I had just got there and uh, about four hours into it my homeboy Gatsby Gatsby Randolph he's like a Hollywood consultant and producer He's a connector. Definitely. He connects people. He connects people. And he said, uh, he said, hey, you uh, you in the city? I said, yeah. He says, all right, I need you to meet me at, might have been Chate Marmont or something, um, French restaurant. 
I said, like, okay. He's like, uh, wear a suit. I said, oh, um, I don't have a suit. I got some sweatpants. They had a little paint on it. I have got a blazer, and uh, I just made that work. And so I met him, and then he's like, all right, come with me. We're gonna go to this this women film event. We went to that, and the vibe was kind of weird. Like uh, everybody kind of was on this elevated kind of posture. I tried to shake. Oh, hey, hey, I'm Genesis, and they kind of look down at my hand, look at my sweatpants, and then like kind of look away, mm-hmm. as if I didn't even speak to them. And and it was a little irritating. And so then all of the things I thought about Hollywood came into my mind, like, oh, okay, this is the Hollywood stuff. And uh, when we were leaving, I said, bro, I don't know. This is going to be kind of tough to get people to come to this show because, I mean, I'm just trying to be a human being right now. And not, we're not even talking about art. This is just me on a human level. They didn't want to interact. And he says, bro, this, that room, that's that's actresses and actors and stuff that they're in their career field you see them on tv but they're they're not in this other level i'm like what are you talking about he says i'm gonna show you so then we go to this uh this this guy's house um and when we went to his house the security was i mean it was insane it was like it was crazier than the white house i don't know if you went by the white house it has nothing on the security of this place. And um, we walked up and he told him his name. He says, I'm, this is Genesis the Great Kid. He's an artist. He's with me. We walk in and uh, I immediately see Usher. And Usher's like, he knows Gatsby. And Gatsby's like, bro, Genesis from Chattanooga too. Usher's like, yo, from Ch-. And then Usher leaned over to me. He said, bro, I don't know how you got here or what you're doing here, but you're doing something right. And like that was his kind of Ch- I know Chattanooga is a small town. Mm-hmm. This is a big room, so and like I mean, and that's what Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos right. and I mean it was it was yeah, world economies in this in this room. It was it was wild, and so everyone in that room was happy to speak to me. They didn't look at my sweatpants and the, like they like Holly Berry. Oh, so you're Genesis? Oh my God! Look, I can't wait to see your art. Oh, where, where can I find? You know, like yeah. everyone was very approachable. And so I was able to invite, I'd say, 70 people from that room to the show. And about half of them showed up, you know, but it was just amazing. And they were way, I mean, as far as in their career, they they were, I don't know if you want to use the word accomplished, but. They made they, it. Yeah, I mean, Leonardo DiCaprio and a bunch of these guys were in this room excited to hear about oh who is this guy he looks different i was the brokest person in the room <laughs> but i was in the room yeah and so the next day the thing you're talking about yeah he's like hey we're gonna do that again we we kind of need to do this every night if you want to get some of the the some of the individuals you think might rally around this artwork we need to kind of be in the room every night i'm like i'm down let's do it i have bought a suit this time <laughs> We uh we went to the Four Seasons. That's where the um, Oscar after party was. And uh, we go in. We go to the front. He's not on the list on this one. He's on a lot of lists. He wasn't on this one. And he says, uh, "It's like, oh man, okay. Um, well, look. Uh, oh, and he saw his homegirl at the bar. He said, like, I just want to talk to my homegirl at the bar. We're going to use the restroom. Is that okay? He's like, oh yeah, you can be out here at the bar. But there was this back room that led to the Oscar after party. That was like high security, can't get any side. Okay, cool. So we go over to the bar. We talk to the lady. She's super cool. Um, she's on the list, but she can't get both of us in. So he's like, oh, we'll meet you back there. I don't know. I'm like thinking, I don't know why he just said that. We, we can't get in. She goes back. We walk towards the restrooms. And then there's double doors on the left before you get to the restrooms. He turns a quick left, goes through the double doors. When they open, it's a kitchen, and the chefs are like cooking, fire and stuff. It's like, whoo. And he just goes in. And I stop. And I said, what is it? What? what? I, you know, I felt weird. I'm like, man, I'm not, I don't, I'm not sneaky. I don't want, that's weird. I can't just go in. 
So he calls me. He's like, bro, what are you, where are you at? I was like, you just went in the kitchen. What do you, what do you mean? He's like, listen, all right, I know, I know. Look, just walk in the kitchen and just tell him the truth. Say, hey, my friend just walked in here. I don't know where he went. Just say that. I was like, all right. And I like was pacing back and forth. And this was me getting in my head. And yeah, I was like, damn, you know, like, I pray, like, say a little quick one. Like, hey, you know, that because I don't, I'm, I'm not from this town. I don't know what happens. You know, they might have threw me, like, in the movies. You you know, they throw the guy on the, yeah. out of the building. <laughs> and so I, I walked in and the chef looked at me. He's like, hey, what are you doing back here? I was like, oh, my friend, he, he just walked in. I don't know where he went. He said, oh, oh, I got you. You must be looking for the big room. And he escorted me into the Oscar after party. When I walk in, he's on the other side of the room with, like, the people from the Black Panther movie. And he holds up his glass. Like Leo like Leo in the Great Gap. He holds up his glass. And I just looked at him and I laughed to myself. Like, that was, that was such a... For me... Being being someone that I mean I travel a lot, yeah. but that was still that just still blew my mind. It blows my mind. I guess I'm with you. I would have stopped, <laughs> but I'd have left. <laughs> yeah, I stopped. I didn't. For me, I thought one in this these double doors, this kitchen. All right, that that was a big hurdle for me because. I already spoke in my brain what I thought was going to happen. I'm going to walk in here. They're going to say, oh, you don't belong here. And they grab me and they just right. throw me out. Maybe the I get a, like the police get called or something. I'm like, no. And they handcuff me. So I don't know. And it's like an embarrassing moment. Then some people film it or something that goes viral. I don't know. Like I, I put all these scenarios in my mind that weren't going to happen. Yeah. And so I do appreciate him for knowing what type of person I am and f- for him to say, okay, okay, I got it. I, I, I can see what this is. Just tell him the truth. Yeah. I walked in. Yeah, you yeah. lost I, me. That's a good point. Because if he just said, tell him this and made up some elaborate thing. I wouldn't have done. I wouldn't have been able to do it. That's a good point. Or if he would have told me, hey, uh, I'm on the list. I couldn't get you in. You go ahead and go through the kitchen. Yeah, it wouldn't. Have, I I couldn't have done it. I would have been sitting outside. That reminds me. I had. I went. My first trip to New York was to cover a Disney movie. Mm-hmm. I think I don't even remember which one it was. Didn't know anything about New York except what I'd heard. Mm-hmm. I was convinced I was going to be mugged, raped, killed, <laughs> everything. Don't make eye contact. <laughs> right. I mean, I don't look my, up at the tall buildings. <laughs> all those things. Right. And so I get off the plane and I'm focused. I'm laser focused. I go get my bags. I get in the taxi and I get to the hotel and I get to my room and I'm like, I made it. And I thought, I have four hours till I have to be anywhere. I'm not going to sit here in a hotel room. Yeah. And the person I shared a cab with pointed out Bloomingdale's mm-hmm. as we drove by on the way in. So I'm going there. Mm-hmm. Went down the block fast as I could go without running. Right. Went up four layers of escalators, made a loop, left, and I thought, I made it. And then I thought, I'm not going back the same way. I'm going to be bold. I'm going the, the other way. Yeah. I go the other way. I round the corner and I almost bump into this short little Asian woman and a short little man in a Gilligan hat and realized it's Woody Allen and soon Lee and I love Woody Allen I thought there I've had my New York moment already yeah anyway, but to get, to get more to your point so that was one lesson for me we were to do interviews with the stars of the movie in this in this hotel no we in MoMA we actually did it in the museum oh nice and then we were supposed to walk over to Central Park for dinner okay now I'm from Chattanooga so I'm thinking dinner is going to be a box lunch <laughs> with a bag of Lay's right. and a pickle. And a you pickle. Know. <laughs> you got to have the pickle. <laughs> and a rye sandwich and a Coca-Cola. Right. So I'm like, I, I don't think I want to do that. I'm going to go back to the hotel. I end up meeting another reporter, um, a guy named Jackie Cooper of all things. Super nice guy. He said, no, come on and go with me. 
So we go into Central Park. Well, mm -hmm. it's Disney. This is my first Disney trip, so I now know they do things first class. So we get there, and there's this giant tent, chefs in the big hats carving oh. roast beef. Nice. You know, it's whatever you want. It's open. It's amazing. And I just randomly grab a table, sit down, and I start talking to this beautiful man and woman and another guy and turns out they are the producer and co-anchors of the South African version of Entertainment Tonight. Mm -hmm. She turns out to be Nelson Mandela's niece. I was going to miss that yeah. because I was getting in my own I'm way. Getting in your own way. That was one of the greatest nights. Rode back on a bus to the hotel with the sun setting over near. I mean, incredible moment yeah. that I would have missed that because missed. I was a baby, basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we allow. Um, you know, Chris Woodhall, a good a good friend of mine. He uh, he he used to. I've seen him speak to some some guys from some pretty chaotic places, uh, some some gangster type brothers, and. Uh, he has this kind of phrase he threw out that I think makes sense for anybody. He he would notice that they kind of fall into this script that they were kind of given. Maybe you came from this environment, maybe you came here. Uh, whatever those conversations are in your head. Oh man, I can't do this. Oh, New York, you know, da da da. I'm like, oh man, we're at the Oscar after fight and I don't want to get in trouble, da da da. Right. And there's these scripts that we start to follow and it could take us away from our our own internal compass that's going to like, you know what I'm saying? And so knowing that we can author our own story, we can we can be the author. You can go have what we wanted to go. Pushing beyond those conventions. That leads me to exactly how I want to end this, which going back to that story of the kitchen, mm -hmm. um, I love that story, but What's important, two things. One, you went in. Yeah. And when we meet again next time, I want to talk about the showing, and it was very successful because the people you met at these things, yeah. a lot of them did show up. A lot of them showed up. Scotty Pippen, who yeah. you didn't meet there, but he showed up. He, he showed up because he heard about it, yeah. Um, some really cool people. but So you went through that kitchen, mm -hmm. and you walked in that room, and when I talked to Gatsby... Uh, later for the story he made a great point he got you in that room but then you did work yeah yeah and that's that's we'll talk about that next that's I, doors get open for people a lot myself included not only you have to walk through it but then you got to do work you got to do the work so Genesis the great kid thank you so much oh, for absolutely, doing this man. this has been a lot of fun I knew it would be been an honor some Always great fun. stories, and, and like I said, you're a, a good example of the cool stuff that's happening here. So thanks for your time. I appreciate it.